type in where you're tuning in from. My name is Will Crane, I'm a physical therapist, and here to be here to talk to you this evening about the NPTE blueprint and about what is going to be on the test a little bit. We talked about that a little last week, or how long ago was that? A few days ago when we did our other free session. But I'm glad to have Shruti here. Shruti is one of our uh, chat box specialists for PT final exams. So if you see her typing in, uh, be sure to pay attention to what she's saying. But yeah, hurry and to, uh, type in where you're tuning, tuning in from. We'll give a shout out to Louisiana, Indiana, uh, San Jose, California, Long Island, New York, Florida, Boca Raton, cool, LA, Bowling Green, Kansas City, New Orleans, Connecticut, Arizona, Livermore, California, Jamaica. You know, this might be the first time I've had someone tuning in from Jamaica, so welcome. Awesome. Ohio, Winnipeg, Buffalo, New Jersey, Michigan, Florida. Sweet. I, t I come tuning in to you from Idaho. Uh, any of you who have been to Idaho, go ahead and give a quick shout out. Idaho is a wonderful state. We just experienced the full total zone of totality during the solar eclipse, which was awesome. Spread all the way from Oregon to South Carolina. So very, very cool. Um, let's see. What else do I want to tell you? Just while we're getting everyone out of the chat, out of the out of the waiting room, out of that, all that elevator music and here into the live session. Um, <laughs> the land of the Yellowstone, that's right. Uh, Toronto, Houston, sweet. Whoop, whoop, I had a great time skiing. I'm glad you had a good time. Idaho is a wonderful place. I really enjoy the outdoors. I enjoy snowmobiling. Uh, I don't get skiing nearly as much as I should. It's about an hour to get to the ski resort and it. I mean, frankly, it's not that far, but it just, I'd rather go snowmobiling. And so I go snowmobiling quite a bit. Uh, we went camping a number of times this summer, which was fantastic. Uh, I've got three little kids, seven, five, and three. And so camping becomes much more of an adventure when you're doing it with little kids. So that was a lot of fun. Um, let's see, what else do I want to tell you about me? I, I introduced myself a bit more in our last free session, but I'll just tell you a little bit more about me while everyone's tuning in. Uh, I graduated from the University of Utah in 2011 with my Doctor of Physical Therapy degree, and I started PT final exam in 2012 as kind of a, you know, I like to say that it was, it was started as a result of feeling a little bit lost preparing for the exam. I think everyone feels that to a certain extent, feels a little bit lost or perhaps is not quite sure what is going to be on the exam, and I wished that someone had just sat down and said, Will, this is what's going to be on the test, so study all this stuff. And rather, it was our program, which was a great program, we learned a lot of the program. They basically just threw us a, a review, review book and said, good luck, we'll see you on the other side of the test. And so my goal is to try to take away some of that pain and anxiety that comes from the NPT, especially when you don't know what's on it or how to prepare effectively. And so, uh, like I said, we did have a free session. Uh, let's see, it's been, what, how long was it, Shruti? It was a couple, was it a week and a half ago, 10 days? We had uh, another live session. And I, I haven't posted the recording yet. I'll post that on my blog, and I'll post that in addition to this. Two weeks almost. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, so I'll post this one in addition to that one. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of the content that I covered that first time around. I'll leave that to you to review on my blog. You can go to blog.ptfinalexam.com. And uh, this session today, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the techniques and, and study strategies that I would recommend for you as you prepare for, for game day, exam day. Okay, so basically our plan, we're going to talk about what's on the NPT in, in, in broad guidelines. We'll talk about the content of what's on the exam. Uh, we'll talk about how it's weighted as far as which categories are the most heavily weighted and you need to study the most. And we'll talk a lot about study patterns, and this is, I get this question all the time. It's like, Will, how do I organize my time? Or Will, what's the best way to study for this exam? So I'll talk about some of my perspectives there. And then I've got two practice questions. We'll review some practice questions and go through some, some real good content. So I want to make it really worthwhile for you. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to tune in with me tonight, and I hope it's useful for you. So with that, I've got a couple of questions for you, though, as we're getting going here. So first question, these are anonymous surveys, so I can't see who's responding to what. But I want to know where you were trained, whether you were trained inside the United States or outside the United States. Generally, we have a good contingency from both, good representation from both those who are foreign trained and those who are domestic trained. 
I like to get a, a broad idea of who I'm talking to during these webinars since in a, in a real sense I'm just talking to myself here in my office. However, I do recognize you guys are on the other end, so I want to make sure that I'm tailoring what I'm saying to you, to a live, uh, to a live audience. So hurry and click in your answer here, where your training was, whether it was inside the United States or outside the United States. Um, so hurry and quick click in there. Then, okay, so your next question I have for you. How many attempts have you had on the NPTE? How many attempts have you had on the NPT? Is this your first attempt? So you have, you've had zero, and so now you, you're working on your first attempt. Are you on your first, second, or third attempt? I know we have a couple of people coming into this next class. I'm run, I run a, a class every, every quarter preparing for the NPTE. My next class starts this Saturday, and I'll talk a little bit about that for anyone who's interested in some of the details there. And I think we'll have a number of folks who are already enrolled for Saturday here today, and so this kind of serves as our debugging session as well, so you can kind of get used to the click webinar format and see how everything's going. But I've got a, 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 let's see, a handful of students who are on their sixth or seventh attempt, they're on their final attempt since the FSBPT put in their, their lifetime limit. I also have a number of folks who are preparing for their first attempt, and the truth is there's really not a lot of difference between those who are preparing for the first or the sixth, we just have to get you above the passing mark, and that's my big goal, is to talk about content in a way that gets you above the passing mark. Okay, and then your final question for you, how do you feel going into this next exam? Are you freaked out, terrified, you have pulse present, but all other signs of life have vanished? How do you feel going into this next exam? So hurry and click in your response here. Hurry and click in your response. How do you feel going into this exam? I dare say that everyone experiences some anxiety to one extent or another. And this is just kind of your normal garden variety, vanilla, plain vanilla test anxiety. This is a high stakes exam. It, it tests you over three years worth of content. It's a big test. You should feel nervous. But the question is, does it, does it per paralyze you? Does the, what, is it, what do you want to say? The terror, does the terror paralyze you? And that's my goal with the class is to take you from that, that paralysis from fear and anxiety and move you towards more of a, a confident or a, at least bring, a, bring some confidence to you as you prepare for the exam day. Because there, there is no doubt about it. Those who have a negative attitude or a lot of anxiety going into test day tend to perform more poorly than those who go in with a positive attitude. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you go into the test saying, oh, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, then usually it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy versus those who go in and say, I got this, I'm good at this, I'm really good at this, and darn it, I'm going to win. <laughs> so if you go at it with that attitude, a lot of times that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You are more relaxed, you answer questions more effectively. Anyway, just one way to look at it. So there you go. Okay, so... Here we go. The first question, what is actually on the NPT? And so I was trying to come up with some visuals for how a lot of times people think about the NPT. The NPT is the National Physical Therapy Examination. It's the board exam that allows you as a PT candidate to become licensed in the United States and begin practicing as a physical therapist. And so a lot of times people create this vision of, oh my goodness, this is, it's just a monster of an exam should be terrified even though this is solely from Monsters, Inc. Or sometimes we think about this, that it's a, a reaction, it, it is a really a lot more complicated. I mean, again, I'm just saying this is what people think. This is what students sometimes imagine is on the test, and very complicated or convoluted. Or another thing is they think that this is like medical school. You have four years of medical training and you have to know every surgery and every, every diagnosis about everything. The truth is, it's not. It's not that complicated. Instead, this is the blueprint for the exam. And I apologize, that's really small font. I've got, uh, got it in text a little bit long, or a little bit, um, what do I want to say, just down the couple of slides from here. I think Shruti even posted a link to the content. Yeah, he did. Uh, Shruti posted a link to the NPT content outline. So the content outline is about 17 pages worth of material that the FSBPT publishes that really outlines what is going to be on the test. Now, this is something that I wish that I had become more familiar with preparing for test day. Because the content outline really doesn't, there's no secret to it. It tells you how many questions 
are in each category, and so therefore you can prepare adequately for each of those categories. Thanks for posting that again, Shruti. Really appreciate it. So, Mauron, your great question about will the blueprint change for 2018? The answer is yes. So I know there are a number of you here who are taking the exam in 2018. And so just to, to briefly hit, I don't want to hit it too hard because there are very minor changes. However, in 2018, the changes primarily affect this system, the cardiovascular, pulmonary, and lymphatic system. See, before they just grouped it all together, cardiopulmonary, or cardiovascular, pulmonary, and lymphatic system. Three big systems just put it all together in a big casserole. Rather, what they're doing in 2018 is they're taking the lymphatic system and they're separating it out into its own category. And by separating it out into its own category, it guarantees that there will be a certain number of lymphatic questions. The truth of the matter is that you are already studying for the lymphatic system and you can expect some lymphatic questions. This just guarantees, I believe there are about five there will be about five lymphatic questions, which honestly, in 2017, you will have about five lymphatic questions. So the changes are, are really quite minor for 2018. The last change they had was in 2013, and it was a pretty massive change. It put the broad emphasis of the exam on the big three systems, whereas before, they had the non-systems and other systems more equally represented, which they felt like was not not um, indicative of what the, the PT education and practice truly was. And so they changed the emphasis. And they made the emphasis primarily on the big three systems. And in 2018, it will still remain as such. It was all that will really change is that you'll have uh, five questions, about, th what is it, three to eight. So more or less five questions on the lymphatic system guaranteed, plus your genital urinary system and other systems. I think you increase by about one more question. So it's, again, very minor as far as things go. And it's honestly what you're already studying. So for the 2018 exam, don't expect any grand shift in the content, just a few, a few kind of rearranged questions, especially in the lymphatic system and the genital urinary system are the ones that are most affected. So there you go. That's the 2018 guidelines. These are the 2013 guidelines. They've, they've stood all the way from 2013 through 2017. And I just want to point out a couple of things here. A lot of people really stress about the non-systems domain. The non-systems domain is down here. It's, it's listed out equipment, modalities, um, devices, safety protection, professional responsibility, research, and evidence-based practice. All this really only totals 12% of the exam or 25 questions. So again, this, this happens all the time. People, after taking a practice exam, they email me and say, hey, Will, I did terrible in the non-systems. What can I do about it? Well, one, just a little bit of perspective, the non-systems has so few questions that it doesn't, you don't have to miss very many in order to show a terrible percentage. So you miss five questions in the non-systems domain and you're already down to 80% versus you miss five questions in the cardio or in the musculoskeletal section and you're still in the 90%. So the same number of questions, it's just the proportion I'm talking about. And then the other thing is, uh, those of you who are already uh, part of my independent study course or the live online review course, I have a whole mini series dedicated to the non-systems. Uh, again, this is where uh, people are always asking me, what's the best textbook for research? Or what's the best, best textbook for professional responsibilities? And honestly, there's no great textbook. And so that, that mini series I have, it's, what is it? It's somewhere between eight and 10 hours worth of lectures takes you really through the non-systems domain, really helps out with clarifying what will be tested and how it will be tested. So there you go. That's the content outline. And I really highly recommend everyone go and check out that link that Shruti posted. It's, or you can Google it, the FSBPT content outline. And be sure to look, those of you who are taking it in October of 2017, make sure you're looking at the 2013 version. And those of you taking it in January will be taking the 2018 version, even though the, the differences are very minor between the two. Okay, so again, what is actually on the NPT? We talked about the, the content outline, but let's really get realistic about what kind of questions will be asked. And really, these are the guidelines. This comes directly from the FSBPT's Canada Handbook. It says that all of the questions have to be entry level. 
So that means they can't be specialist or require a, a specialist certification to answer. They have to be entry level, which means basically what you would encounter in your first year of general physical therapy practice. First year of general physical therapy practice. The other thing is that it has to be current content. By current content, that means that it be, needs to be published in a textbook within the last five years. And again, this is something that gives us gives a lot of people a lot of heartburn when they ask, well, Will, what about the new research that's coming, about, coming out about this? Or the new research about, I don't know, fill in the blank item that is kind of the hot button uh, or hot topic in physical therapy. Well, the truth is if it's not in a published respected textbook, it's not likely to show up on the NPTE. Possible, yes, but it takes about two years for these questions to be formulated. So that's why they really go to the textbooks for their primary, for their, yeah, their primary resource for creating the questions. All right, so the development. And this is something I talked about the last time, but I just want to briefly hit on it, that uh, the test is developed from volunteer item writers. So you, a lot of people ask, you know, well, who, who actually writes this test, Will? Are they crazy? Are they, they these professor nerds sitting in some cubicle a thousand miles away? No, the, the writers of the test are actually your peers. They're physical therapists uh, directly. Well, what happens is they go, the FSBBT takes their show on the road, and they get volunteer item writers all throughout the country, throughout all the practice spectrum, you know, from every practice setting and across the practice continuum of age, you know, those who are freshly minted to those who are very seasoned therapists. And they, they educate them and they help them write the, the items that will potentially end up on an NPTE. And then they go through about eight different committees. And it, like I said, it takes about two years for the item to go from being written or initially created until it's actually on your exam. And one thing that happens to every single item is they are each rolled out as what's called a pretest item. So when you're taking the test, you have 250 questions. However, only 200 of those are scored. 50 of those questions are what they call pretest items or uh, just practice test items that the FSBBT is testing out in a test environment to see what their statistical validity is. They want to see if people who pass the NPTE get them right and people who fail the NPTE get them wrong. They're trying to titrate it just right. And so, the, and they use a lot of, they use, oh, what are they? They've got a couple of committees just for statistics. And if you're like me, statistics was not my favorite class in college. I, I recognize it's important, but statistical analysis just sounds so terribly boring. Bless their hearts for doing that. I'd rather do physical therapy. So they use this item response theory. They go through all this, uh, you know, really com complex and convoluted uh, statistical analysis to make sure that the questions are valid according to their standards. And then you have to have what's uh, or a 600 out of 800 scale score in order to pass the exam. Now that just means that on on any given day, there are somewhere between five and ten exam forms. So that means if you're taking an exam and you're sitting right next to your buddy who's taking an, the NPT the same day at the same time, you will purposely not be given the same exam form. You'll be taking two totally different NPTEs. And the reason they do the scale scoring is because each NPTE is slightly different from the other. And so they scale it. It's not a curve. They don't fail everyone who's 70, you know, it's not a bell curve thing where they fail everyone below a certain point of the curve. No, they're just trying to e make equivalent the different exam forms. And so really your target, people ask me this all the time, Will, what's the target on my practice exam? Well, your target should be 100%, right? But the target should be above 75%. That's the most highly correlating, the score that most highly correlates to the 600, 600 out of 800. However, I have seen exam forms, and this is from student exam reports that they, they share with me and we can talk about it. I've seen people who pass the exam somewhere down around the 65 to 67% mark. So again, for what it's worth, I tell people that usually if you're testing in the high 60s to low 70s, that's borderline and, and an indicator that you are pretty much ready for the test. Obviously, the higher, the better, but that's kind of the cutoff mark right there. 
And then, uh, interestingly, each item, each question on the NPT is only used one or two times before it's retired forever. You'll never see it again. It's never repeated, and it's stored in their vault somewhere, and uh, you'll never, ever see it again. So, again, all of this is just to prevent cheating, because obviously you don't want incompetent physical therapists out there, which is a danger to the public. And so, therefore, they take all these precautions to make sure that no cheating can occur and that the test is difficult enough to keep those who are who are not ready to practice, but not so difficult that you prevent those who are ready to practice. So that's, that's their whole mission statement. All right, so let's talk about each of the, the content areas on the exam. I just, I, I put it in this format just to give you a little bit of, uh, what do you want to say, a little perspective for what is tested on the exam. The biggest one by far, and this is the PT's bread and butter, 61 questions on the NPT are related to the musculoskeletal system. 50 questions to the neuromuscular and 33 to the cardiopulmonary, cardiovascular pulmonary and lymphatic system. So these big three represent most of the exam. Basically, well, if you include the other systems, I mean, that's 75, well, over 75, over 80% of the exam comes from all of that. The other systems, which includes the system interactions, the gastrointestinal, genital, urinary, and tegumentary systems, covers 31 questions, and then the non-systems, the one that everyone hates, really only covers about 25 questions. So my suggestion here is to study proportionately. Make sure you're spending time in the big three. And so, again, a mistake that I've seen in the past is uh, someone will get a bad score on their non-systems domain, spend all of their time studying the non-systems domain at the expense of not studying the others. And so they hit test day, they, they crush the non-systems domain, but they still fail the other 88% of the test. So point is study proportionally. Make sure you're hitting those big three, big three. All right, yeah, let me just look through the questions here. Let me look through the questions here. So Shruti, thank you so much for answering questions in there. Uh, study partners. So Maron, anyone who's a part of my class, I have a study partner list you can add your name to. So if you're, if you're tracking down a study partner, that's a good place to do it. I would ask you to hold off on finding study partners at this very moment, just because it'll fill up the chat box with names and email addresses. Let's just hang on to that. I'll leave the chat box open at the end so you can track down a study partner if you wish then. Um, let's see, looking at your, over here at your questions. Uh, uh, AC, is there a way we can apply to have our test rechecked? I got a 594 last July. So AC, great question. The short answer is yes, the long answer is, that it usually doesn't change anything uh, just because it's graded by the computer. And this is, I've talked to them about it, I've talked to FSBPT about it, and I've even, even had a handful of students who have paid for the score verification. None, of, none have changed. However, I'll tell you my opinion about that is that when you call the FSBPT to get your score verified, they will tell you that you probably shouldn't waste your money because it's scored by computer. There's very little room for error in a multiple choice test. I mean, yeah, they. They, they basically try to talk you out of it. And so ironically, by talking everyone out of it, very few people actually go through it. And of those very few, none of them have ever been changed. And so that, that's the statistic they always tell you, that no score has ever been changed from failed to passing as a result of the, of the recheck or the score verification. So it's, it's kind of a, I don't know that I would do it just because the likelihood of a change is very low. However, if you feel very strongly about it, then you should go with your gut and do that. I, I, I recognize that it's harder in cash and it can make a difference, maybe, but the likelihood is very, very low. Let's see, Hadia, does the independent study course come with a textbook and does it cover the same content? So Hadia, you're asking questions, and I think there's a couple of questions about the in, my independent study course versus my live online course. And I'll talk about that in detail here coming up. So let's hold those questions for just a minute. Uh, let's hold those questions for just a minute. Da, 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 da. Um, looking through the questions here. Oh, Milena, so great question, Milena. I'm so glad you asked that. So does that mean that one question in the non-systems is worth more than one question in the musculoskeletal? No. Each question is by itself worth, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not really points. It's like, it's, like I said, it's a scale scoring. But each item is equal to every other item, meaning that 
the items in the non-systems are, are equal in value to the items in the musculoskeletal system. So really, this is really what it means, is that if you totally bomb non-systems and you get, you get 0 out of 25 in the non-systems, but get everything else right, you will still totally pass your test because you'll have greater than 70 or 75%. So each item is worth the same as every other item. There's no weighting of specific items. There's also not a penalty for guessing. And so like there are, there are a couple of standardized exams out there that give you a penalty if you, do, if you guess. The NPT is not that way. There's no penalty for guessing. So always make sure that you have an answer selected before you move on to the next question. That's a will tip right there. Never move on to the next question without, without making sure that you have an answer selected and you've moved on. Even if you mark it and you want to come back and review it later or what have you. Always mark it before you go on, just because you never know if, you, the, if you'll run out of time or not, or if you'll have time to come back and answer that. Just mark something down and move on. Um, let's see, so there's no penalty for guessing. Oh, and the other, the other myth is that it's a adaptive or computerized adaptive testing, where the, the questions increase in difficulty the more you get right, or they decrease in difficulty the more you get wrong. That is not the case, absolutely, absolutely not the case. It is just 250 questions presented to you in random order and just 250 questions. Because with a true computerized adaptive test, you would not be able to return to items to go back and review them. You have to select and move on and you cannot return. And so anyway, and I've, I've been to the FSBPT headquarters. I've talked to the folks. They haven't changed this. It was this way when I took the test. It is just a plain, plain Jane tests 250 questions so no uh, no adapt adaptations or no adaptive programming or anything like that just 250 questions just answer them boom let's see da, 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 da. looking through the questions uh, more questions about my independent study course versus my live course and I'll talk about that uh, da, 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 da. and again if you would hold off putting emails and study partners here in this chat box or we'll hold on to that till the end you can try to find a study partner at the very end again just try to keep everyone on topic okay so with that let's talk about so now here's your study tip so now we're switching gears from what's on the test to more how to prepare for the test and so now I'm giving you a little bit of PT uh, content at the same time as I give you my advice, because there's so much overlap. Did you actually know that PT is the center of the universe? Everything we do in physical therapy actually, you know, applies to every other aspect of our lives, right? It's the most effective medicine, you know, we're the coolest people on earth, you know, it's just, you know, a little bit of PT pride right there. But, okay, so here's some definition for you. In physical therapy, in the, in the practice of physical therapy, we have different ways of practicing. We're talking about practicing a task. So when a person has had a stroke or a person is learning to walk after an ankle injury, we, we have to practice the task or portions of the task in order to return them to their prior level of function. That's our goal. We're functional specialists. We're trying to return them to their function. So there are a couple of different definitions that you need to know here. And like I said, this is content. This is straight out of uh, Motor Control by Shumway Cook. It's a fantastic book. I recommend everyone track this one down. Motor Control by Shumway Cook. All right, so massed practice. Massed practice, this is where you have your practice time is greater than your rest time. Just like it describes, let's say you're trying to practice walking. You have the person walking during your 45-minute session. They are walking 40 minutes out of, the, out of the session. I mean, you're just really blasting through the practice of that task or whatever item it is. The problem with mass practice is that the patient tends to fatigue quickly. And so there are very few instances, and I can't think of any right off the top of my head, where you would choose to just do mass practice. I mean, the one, the one instance that does come to me is if there's some sort of psychological disorder or delay, developmental delay, where the person has a hard time planning or programming and you just need to work on something over and over again. But again, very it's it's not used as much as something called distributed practice. So distributed practice is where the rest time is equal to or greater than the practice time. 
Now, the reason this works is because, you know, you'd think, well, heck, can't if if we want them to walk better, shouldn't we just make them walk for 45 minutes the whole appointment time? Rather, your goal is maybe to get higher quality sets, but shorter sets with adequate rest time between. Because with mast practice, their form actually begins to fall. And you can imagine this. They begin to fatigue. Their form starts to fall apart and everything. It's just you're practicing bad behaviors at that point. So that's why mast practice is kind of not, not very popular. You just don't do that very much. Versus distributed practice where you give adequate rest times in order to allow them to recover and then perform the task well again. So then when you combine that with these next ideas, so we've talked about massed practice and distributed practice, let's talk about constant practice versus variable practice. So variable practice is where you practice the task in a multitude of ways or situations or speeds or difficulty levels. You vary it. Versus constant practice would mean that you do the same task over and over again. So to rise from a chair, you'd have them just stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down. They just constantly do the exact same thing. Versus the variety would perhaps be to stand from a chair that's a little bit taller. Another one would be to work on some standing squats. I mean, they're all working on the same muscle groups and kind of the same coordinated effort, but in a variable way. So it accomplishes the same purpose, but in a in a variable practice setting. And the reason is that they're able to retain that information and then generalize it down the road to novel situations. Which is cool because we want them to. I mean, a lot of the skills we teach patients are open skills or skills that have to be practiced outside of a clinical environment. You know, like walking in the mall or going to the grocery store where there are unpredictable things around them or unstable surfaces or what. So that's why we spend a lot of time in variable practice. Okay, and then the third thing, or is this the fourth thing? I don't know. Whatever, this last item on this, on this slide, I want to talk about is random practice versus blocked practice. And this is, again, back to a similar idea that random practice is where you switch it up frequently throughout your practice session versus blocked practice means you practice the same thing. Um, let's see, what's a good example? So if you're doing blocked practice, you would practice... During gait, you do hip advancements, like three sets of 50 hip advancements. That's all blocked together. And then you do three sets of, of 50 ankle dorsiflexions. You block that one, dorsiflexion. That just doesn't work nearly as well or as effectively as a random practice, meaning that you do maybe a few repetitions of the hip advancement. Then you do some repetitions of the ankle dorsiflexion. Then you combine them a little bit. And so the idea is that you're randomly assigning tasks, uh, portions of the task, what happens is that that actually transfers better onto the performance of the whole task as compared to just block practice where you do one and then the other and the other and the other. So that's the idea of practice. So that's the idea of practice. Now I want to take that, like I said, the world revolves around physical therapy, which you guys all know. So I'm going to take that and put that into a PT perspective. And I've got the Harvard Journal, Harvard Review Journal backing me up on this one, that when it comes to studying and preparing for the exam, the same principles apply in our studies as they do to our patients. So that's good to know. So once you know what to do with the patient, you should know re reasonably well what to do with yourself. So the first thing is to do distributed practice and so this is one that just came out this year. There are a couple of studies that are really coming out, focusing on what it was is uh, these reviews were looking at what habits were most effective or the high, had the highest utility in material content retention compared to those that had the least utility or the lowest value in retaining information. Now this is important because on test day you have to have all this information stored it safely inside your brain. They're going to test you on it whether you study it or not. So let's just, let's make sure that it sticks and this is the best way to make things stick. So distributed practice, what it is, is they, they describe a pattern that goes a little bit like this. And I'll try to explain it. It's a lot like, like, like uh, dropping a, a rock into a puddle and seeing the ripple effect going out. See what happens with the distributed practice is that you have an initial blast or burst of information. 
So let's say this is like a lecture. You attend my lecture on Saturday. You have this burst of information. You hear the lecture. You take the notes. Boom, you've got the new information. The idea is then that the next day you spend five to ten minutes reviewing your notes from the blast of information. Then you space this out a little bit farther. This looks like an EKG, but this is not an EKG. This is a study pattern. And what happens is you go at, at increasing intervals, short periods of study, reviewing this content. So if this is our target content, you know, let's say two or three hours of the target content, and then every, and they didn't specify how many days had to be between each one in the Harvard study. However, they noted that the first one would be relatively soon, so one to two days. The next one would be three to five days, seven to 14 days, 14 to 21 days, and then more or less about once a week or once every 10 days. You would review that same material. Now, the reason this works is because, so I'm going to switch colors here. The next day, you have another burst of information. So this is the next lecture you attend or the next textbook you read. Burst of information, then you add it to the schedule. And you just add it right next to the other ones. Then you have another blast of information here. Let me, let me change colors one more time. That's yellow. Maybe you can't see that very well. but Red, yellow, and blue. Primary colors. Boom. So the idea is that with the burst of information or the learning or the true mastering of a concept, the way you retain that is to frequently go back and review the notes. So the way that a lot of times people do it is they'll learn something and then they won't think about it or look at it for six weeks while they study everything else. It tends to not stay or not stick very well. And so that's why distributed practice or spacing out the, the time between your review per periods or distributing it out is one of the most effective ways to get information to stick inside your head. The next one is random practice. So this is interesting. Sometimes I hear people say that, you know, maybe we should just focus on musculoskeletal today, neuromuscular tomorrow, cardio, I mean, to, to really delineate each system and say, I'm not studying anything else except that system and only that system today. I understand that and it, it can be an adequate uh, study method because a lot of times you don't have enough time to really hit everything. But I think what I really want to point out here is that on test day, they test you over the full spectrum of topics all together, all randomly mixed up. And so I, th I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you never mix topics or you never create this random practice where you're taking a variety of topics and studying them. And so that's why I like to group my assignments not by body system but by content area. And so that means that in my first assignment in the course, I like to have everyone focus on the examination portion of the exam meaning your data collection, your tests and measures, your examination, all, all of the things that go into the history, review of systems and examination across all of the body systems. What it does, it creates that variety of topics and you tend to have better retention as a result. I was really happy when Harvard backed me up on that one because I like it that way. I think it's better than just going line by line, musculoskeletal, neuromuscular, and cardiopulmonary. I like to hit examination, evaluation, differential diagnosis, prognosis, and intervention across the systems. And Harvard backs me up on that one. So I like that one. Then the third thing that was the, of the most use to students preparing for a big exam was to do practice testing. And I've been a huge advocate for what, almost six, five years, five, six years now, that you have to do your practice testing in a test-taking environment. This means that you're not looking at the answers, you don't have distractions, you're really trying to, to answer the questions in earnest how you would perform on test day. Because what, what happens is, so if, you, if you're taking your test and you kind of half-heartedly you know, look at question one and like, oh, I think it's C, then you go back and look at the answer at the end of the book and it's like, yeah, look, it was B, I, I knew it, it was B, I, I just said it was C, but I knew it was B. How many of us do that? We convince ourselves that we knew it, but we didn't actually commit to it. And that's what the test-taking environment does, is it makes you commit, really makes you commit. Okay, then there's a couple of things that I add to, to my suggestions that, or that work for me. 
I suggest that you have something called high density study time. High density study time means that you've eliminated the cat videos or the Facebook or whatever it is that distracts you. And I dare say that two hours of high density study time can be the same or have the same value as eight hours of low density study time. And there's a couple of reasons for that. For one, we as humans, are, we just aren't wired for eight hours of deep concentration. It's just hard to do. We fatigue, we get distracted, we just fall apart. Usually shorter bouts of study tend to be much more effective at retaining information com as compared to longer bouts, you know, eight to 12 hours at a time. It just it doesn't stick when you go eight to 12 hours at a time. So I, I highly recommend, you know, two to four hours of really high density study time where you've eliminated distractions and you're focused on, and this is what the next item I, I wrote here is to have a goal. So what I mean by this is that when you sit down to study, have a specific target of what you are studying and what will you master today? What are you going to become really good at? What are you going to be profoundly versed in so that if I were to call you up right after your study session and said, hey, what did you just study? Tell me all about it. You would, with your notes closed, be able to say, well, Will, let me tell you about the liver. Hepatitis A, B, and C, I know all about that stuff and why it's important and how it affects physical therapy. And so you see the difference between the low-density studier, which sits down and just tries to read a textbook from start to finish, versus those who go in with a goal and actually try to learn something. And if you try to learn something and master it, you can then apply this to the distributed practice curve that Harvard recommends, where you learn it and then review it with increasing intervals. And, you know, these are just short, you know, 10 minutes before you start studying something else you go back and review what you studied and you can retain it so much better. And this also relates to number six. And you know, I watched the Star Wars Episode Eight trailer today, so I had the, the force on my mind, obviously. You know, that's, that's a thing. And um, I suggest that you take good care of yourself while you're studying. Now tell me if any of you have had this happen to you before. You go in and you study in the library for 12 hours. You come out, you hate it. You hated the study session, you didn't learn very much, and you're just miserable and you can't wait for it to be over. It becomes just a, another checklist. It's like, I studied today, but I am so done with that because I hate it. Rather, I'd, I would have you balance your life, meaning that maybe take a shorter, higher density studying approach, but then balancing that in your life with, the, with exercise, with positive relationships, with family and friends, uh, taking a movie, good nourishment to your body, I mean, all those things become a balance of yourself. And if you're miserable studying, you hate it. And if you hate studying, nothing sticks. Versus, think back to your first, maybe, I don't know when this was, your first semester of PT school, or maybe your, your last semester of your undergraduate before PT school, when you felt driven to learn and you were excited about why you were going into the PT world. Think about how that feels as compared to locking yourself in the basement I'm becoming a test zombie. You know, that's why I put Mr. Test Zombie here. Being a test zombie makes life miserable. You hate it and you just don't retain information. You just don't retain information. All right, let's see. Uh, let me see if I can look at the questions here. Okay, so Shruti, you answered already. 72 seconds per item. That's on the test. You have five hours total. You have a 15-minute break after the second section where you, uh, it's a scheduled break, which means the clock stops for you. So you can go out and go to the bathroom and then come back in. However, uh, you are allowed to take breaks between the other sections. So if you really got to go to the bathroom, you can take a break between the other sections, but recognize that time is deducted from your overall time. So you only have one scheduled break after section two. Let's see. Da -da. Looking through the answers. DJ, how would you dis exactly describe a pure test taking environment? It's just one where you've eliminated distractions and you pretend like it's the real deal. You're not looking at answers or outside sources. It's quiet. Uh, uh, well, I take that back. I guarantee you that when you get into the testing center, the Prometric Testing Center on test day, the guy next to you will have tuberculosis and will be hacking out a lung the whole time. He'll just be hacking, hacking, hacking away. So maybe go study at, and this is, you know, it's kind of a catch-22, but 
Sometimes I've had people go and, st and do their practice exams at like a Starbucks or a coffee place or, or some place where there's background ambient noises in preparation for test day. Let's see. Da, 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 five hours. Dar, let's see. Dar, did you have a question? Did I say, oh, let's see. Our paper NPT given for accommodation request is NPT list accommodations. That is by the state or jurisdiction. So Dara, great question. Those of you who are seeking accommodation, the FSBBT uh, abides by the ADA or American Disability Act about providing accommodations for those who need it. And the accommodations can vary. The most common accommodation I see is time and a half. We get an increased amount of time. However, the spectrum goes, I also had a student a while ago who had two days to take the full test on paper in a private room. It just depends. This person had some pretty significant uh, mental disorders that required them to, to have those accommodations, so they were very valid and backed up with medical underwriting. However, um, the most common one is the time. Trudy, if you wouldn't mind looking up FSPPT accommodations, there's a document that explains the whole process for getting ADA accommodations or the NPT. So just a quick Google search usually finds that, FSPPT ADA accommodations. Let's see, we talked about test environment. Da, 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 da. How do you... Any questions? Can we have water or food during the break? Yes, you can bring some water, food. Grab, like in my case, there was a drinking fountain in the hallway. I had a granola bar in my little locker. I went and got my granola bar, took a, took a quick drink, and then I was back into the exam. I'm, I'm what they call a seeker during a test. And I, the best way, I had someone describe that to me, let's see, a year ago, and I thought it described me so well. I didn't want to take my break. I was in a groove, and I wanted to really move on. And so there are some people that are like that, that taking a full 15-minute break really breaks their momentum. So this is why I have you take it in a practice environment so you understand what kind of a test taker you are. Are you a seeker that you need that rhythm and that momentum, and you're just looking for that last question? You're just chugging through looking for that last question. Or are you someone that fatigues quickly and really needs the break in order to be able to perform well on sections three, four, and five? And I'm not saying one is, one is better. Or they're just different from each other. And just find your style so that you know what to do with that break. Now, I think there's a couple of you here who are, who are like me. You're just a seeker. You're looking for that last question. So any break is just a distraction. I want to be back in and focused in on it. Versus those who take a break, who, you know, do a little yoga in the hallway and deep breathing in the hallway and come back in. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. So food and drink. Yes, yes. When will the start of the online review be for January exam? So my review, I start about eight weeks before every exam. So for the January exam, I'll be starting that at Thanksgiving time or the end of November. ZJ, where does the first section end? The first section, each section is 50 questions long. So 50 questions. Once you submit each 50 question section, you cannot return to that section. So it's given to you in 50, section, 50 question blocks, and you cannot return to the other sections. So you just take one section at a time, and once you've submitted that section, don't even, just don't think about it anymore because it's done and gone. Focus your energy on the next section. Uh, Novasat, do you think there's enough time to complete studying from now until the October exam? Absolutely. However, the tr the longer answer is it depends. Those you know, and someone who's been out of school for a long time and is very unfamiliar with the technical content will have a difficult time getting it all crammed in in the next eight weeks. Versus someone who's just you know fresh out of school, they just finished their last rotation, boom, really really fresh. Then you know eight weeks would be very sufficient. So. I don't know. We can talk about your case in particular, but most of the time, eight weeks of good dedicated studying time is enough. Most of the time. Most of the time. DJ, so I can take the 15-minute break after the 100, first 100 questions? Yes. So your first break, the scheduled break, comes after your first 100 questions, or the two, it's after section two. After section two. Okay, so now let's talk about, uh, there were some questions a little bit ago about PT final exam, what I have to offer. So I do have an online review program. This is my moment to, to pitch the, the uh, review program that I've got, which is awesome, by the way. 
And, uh, but then we're going to get into some practice questions too. So don't go away. I've got some practice questions coming just around the corner here. But I just want to answer some of the questions that are about it. So I have a live online review course that I run every quarter about eight weeks before each exam date. I know there are a number of you who are here today who are already signed up for that. I'm really excited to have you in the class and we're going to get going on Saturday morning and it's just going to be like wind through your hair. All the content we'll be going through. So it's going to be awesome. We're looking forward to it. Starting this Saturday is our live online review course. Now the cool part about the live online review course is that it gives you access not only to live lectures like this where I, I also have a team of physical therapists who help me present content and we focus very, very heavily on content. Talk a lot about how to apply the content and really analyze it the way that the NPT would have you do it. The other thing that, that we're really the only one, we started doing this and there are a few copycats who are trying to do it, but they're just not, it's just not working out for them. We have really, truly, true, unedited customer reviews like you'd see on Amazon. You can see what people are saying about the class. If you go to ptfinalexam.com and look at the reviews tab, you can see the, the average star rating. You can submit your own review. I mean, it's a great way to see what students are saying. And let me tell you, we've got over 300 five-star reviews. We've been doing this for five years. I mean, it's just, you just won't find a quality course like this anywhere. Plus, we also have a satisfaction guarantee, meaning that you can test drive the course. You can decide whether or not you like me or hate me, uh, whether you like the content or the structure of the course. And if it's just not a good fit for you, we give you your money back within 14 days. So it's just a chance to test drive the material. The other thing that I added this last year, which I think is a lot of fun, is that you can buy a till you pass access, till you pass access pass. And so it's kind of redundant to say that. But you can buy till you pass access which means if you're targeting a later exam date, you can have access to as many of my courses as you want up for up to two years or until you pass the exam. It's a great way to, to what do you want to say? So if you plan on taking the exam down the road a little ways, it's a really good fit for that. So you can have more time to study. Otherwise, my three month, which is probably my most popular one, 449 gets you access to the coaches, gets you access to, to all the instructors. I've got a, like I described, I have a video library for the non-systems, the integumentary system, gate deviations. Um, yeah, just we've got a boatload of resources. Workbook, workbook key, study guide, uh, practice exam, practice exam key, study outline. I mean, we give you the whole enchilada. And I, I dare you to find more value for your buck online than what you'll find with us. And we really like doing it too. And so hopefully that, that translates into performance on our part we can help you get through. And really, our pass rates are over 90% for full participators. This means people who actually come and do what I tell them to. Those who just disappear into the woodwork or choose to do their own system tend to not have quite as high of a rate. But for full participators, do everything. I've got an over 90% pass rate. And um, you can dive in and, and check it out. Like I said, I've got a satisfaction guarantee. If you hate it, I'll give you your money back. Uh, just a great way to test drive the material and see if you like it. So the independent study course is less expensive. It's only $99 for 30-day access. Um, but it, it has essentially the same content as the live course, just no live webinars, no live access to instructors. Uh, you can't, it's just you eliminate all the live portions of, the, of my course, and you just have all the pre-recorded content. So it's a great fit if you're an independent studier, you don't really feel like you need live classes, and you'd rather just watch recordings. That's a great way to dive into. So that's the big, big difference between the independent study course and my live online review course. With the live online review course, you get access to everything. The whole enchilada. Everything I've got, you have access to. Let's see. Da -da, looking through the questions. Rubel, is it essential to go through the textbooks again on top of reviewing the practice questions? It depends, Rubel. So if you know the content well, a lot of times just a quick review will bring you up to speed. But if it's content you're not very familiar with, there's nothing that replaces going back and reading it from the textbook because that's where the exam content comes from, is from the textbook. Let's see. Did, uh, Novasat, if I miss an online class, uh, can I have an opportunity for viewing it later? Yes, I record everything. So if during the live class you happen to miss one or you're sick or your computer dies or, or my computer dies or something and 
Anyway, I record everything so you can go back and watch it later. The fun part about watching it later is you can watch me and you can do it in 2x speed and move through it really, really fast and have so I can have a chipmunk voice. It's a lot of fun if you'd like to watch things in fast speed. So ZJ, I hear there's a hub page in the pre-recorded live classes. How do we get to those? So ZJ, that's from early this year. I used to have something called a hub page. Nowadays, with my live course, I have pretty much everything restructured so that the independent study course has access to all of that in the modules. So it's just an outdated term. I'll be updating those videos here in the next month or two. And so you'll, that's the cool part about the independent study course is that you'll get access to old videos and new videos as I update them. Uh, Ramel, has the material changed since last year's content? No, the content outline from is still the same as it was in 2013, and the change will be in 2018. Let's see. Is the eight-week review course considered three-month access? Yes. So some people sign up. The reason I, I say the three-month access is because a lot of people will sign up immediately after an exam, and they have con access to all the independent modules and all the videos and whatever, so they can have it for up to three months. And no matter when you sign up, you'll have access to it for a full three months. So, you know, heaven forbid you don't make it through on an attempt, you'll still have access to the content based on when you signed up. So you get a full three months no matter what. But really the meat and potatoes of the course is that last eight weeks, the eight weeks before exam day. And I found that most people usually sign up about three weeks before I start. So they have pretty much 11 weeks of access to the content. So thus, thus my structure. I hope... It's a little bit of methods to the madness. But I try to, you know, try to get uh, help as many people as I can based on where they are uh, schedule-wise. Let's see. Da -da -da. Looking through the questions here. Jessica, what do you recommend for studying? Like how, how long I study around two to three hours in each system every day. I've been studying only musculoskeletal, but I understand now that random studying is better. Well, Jessica, the only reason random studying is better is because that's how the test is. You, you'll go from one system to another. So that's how I like to study. Now, now don't get me wrong. If, if you've got something that's working for you, you know, dive in and make it happen. But statistically, you tend to retain more information when you have shorter but higher density duration study periods in a more random pattern or a distributed pattern where... You're going through a variety of content on a regular basis, but not 8 to 12 hours a day. So, that, I mean, that's just what Harvard recommends. And what do they know, honestly? But uh, really, just do what works best for you. And that's, that's the bottom line here. Do what works best for you. See, how do you, so those live classes become available for independent study course as well, but later? Yeah, usually... The live classes are delayed somewhere around three months by the time I get them all recorded and then post them all up. It takes me a while to all that, you know, to take all the live courses and post them into the independent study course. But eventually that is what happens. Uh, let's see, Vidant, I'm working full time while studying, so I cannot be present during live sessions. What do you suggest? So, uh, two suggestions either uh, just watch the recordings of the live sessions afterwards. You can, I usually have those recordings posted within 12 hours. So you can watch those sessions you know, right away afterwards and review them as many times as you want. Um, but the other option is to just do the independent course. The big difference is do you need support? Do you need to ask me questions? Do you have questions for me or the instructors? If you do, then the live course is really a much better fit versus the independent study course, which is done independently. Let's see, Rubel, do you also do rationalization with the practice tests? I, I think what you mean is to analyze and look at the rationales. Yes, after you take a practice test, be sure to review it thoroughly. Let's see, Amelia, I'm already I'm signed up for the course starting on Saturday for my second attempt. I've already used up my PEATS and taken all three therapy ed exams. Do you recommend I purchase new exams, and which company do you recommend? Well, really, there's only about 11 or 12 quality practice exams out there, and you've taken the therapy ed practice questions, the PEAT practice questions. The score builders have five. They've got three with the textbook plus two in their online advantage. So probably that's your next step is to grab a copy of the score builders book, which comes with three tests. And then I provide one as a part of the course as well. So if you add all those up, what is that, five, eight, about 11, 11 practice exams that are really high quality. 
And then there's other, you can buy a couple, there's a couple of apps out there and a couple of ways to do it, but um, those are probably the best ones. Let's see, Jessica, how long should I study for each system every day? Um, that's an individualized, it really depends on how much time you have. But, you know, if you could get, I really, I, I think a solid four hours total of study time each day is a good target. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but that's kind of a good target. Let's see. Is there a schedule for the live webinars that will take place? Yes. You go to, uh, sure, if you could grab the link to the, to the live online review course enrollment page, there's a Google calendar halfway down where you can go down and see when, you know, what days and what times the sessions will begin. So if you grab a quick link to that. Well, I've got a link here. Sorry. I have a link too, but Shruti can put in a clickable link in the chat box if you want. Let's see. Sign up if you haven't. Will and the other instructors are amazing. Oh, good. I'm so glad, Meredith. I appreciate it. I'll pay you later for that one. But uh, no, honestly, folks, it's awesome. I really like it. Let's see. How often the live classes? They're typically on the weekend. They're typically Saturday mornings and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday evenings. So more or less four each week. Yeah, more or less four each week. Uh, Nat, is it possible to switch to the live course if we find we need more guidance? Absolutely, yes. I'm, always, I'm, I'm easy to work with. If we can work out an arrangement where you've already paid for one thing, want to upgrade for another, I can usually work out a discount, you know, vice versa, whatever. A lot of my costs are associated with streaming the videos, putting up these massive videos in this video library. Who knew? It's just so expensive to have videos that are not on YouTube. On YouTube, they're totally free, but to host them yourself, so that's, that's where a lot of the cost goes. And so... Therefore, when we talk about getting you upgraded one way or the other, that we have to take that into account. But I'm really easy to work with when it comes to getting upgraded or moved from one to another. So, Let's see. Vidant, great thing. So I can post my questions in between the two classes. I think, I think you mean, can I ask, you know, can you ask questions of the instructors between classes? Yes. Email us. And a lot of times we get, like I was on the phone for an hour or two today with, uh, other students in the course who are who had questions for me, and I, we just scheduled some time to chat on the telephone, and it was great. See, Brianna, is there something we should, or when should we start taking the practice exams? Is that something you are going to review in your live course? Yep, I'll talk about that on Saturday, but essentially you'll take one each week, or one every other week, kind of in that, in that it depends on how many practice exams you have available. Some people only have four practice exams available, so they'll take it once every other week, more or less. And some have a few more, you have eight practices exams available, so they'll take one, about one each week. Ashley, are all the times in the calendar for the live course listed in mountain time? Yes, I live in the mountain time zone, which conveniently is right between Pacific and Eastern time zone, well, sort of in between. There's also Central time zone, but we don't, we don't talk about the Central time zone. I'm just kidding. But mountain time zone tends to work for both sides of the country, and so that's why I post things in mountain time zone, but recognize... Eastern time zone, you're two hours ahead of me. So right now it's it's 5 p.m. for me, so 7 p.m. for you. And those of you in California, it's 4 p.m. for you and 5 p.m. for me, so you're one hour behind. Now, Will Crane is a cool guy. Again, I'll pay you later too. Awesome. Uh, hello, I'm preparing for the Canadian PCE. Will this course be relevant? Kirti, yes. I've had a number of students who have taken my course in preparation for the professional, or let's see, the physiotherapy competency exam, the PCE for Canada. It's the same content, the same textbooks. Um, their structure is a little bit different. So, you know, my when I talk about 72 seconds per item and, and 50, 50 questions per section, just know that Canada is a little bit different, but it's the same content. It is absolutely the same content. Danielle, thank you. And about how long are the live videos? Our Saturday sessions usually go for about two hours, and our midweek sessions in the evenings tend to go for about one hour to one, one and a half hours. I see Matthew. I typically benefit from independent study. If I purchase the 30-day access twice, would that give me full eight weeks, or is it costs, or is it the same content twice? Well, what it is is I've got there's two plans on the independent study course. You can do the 30-day access, which is when it's billed month to month, so you just you'd have a subscription for the two months, and then you could cancel it anytime you want, or you can buy what's called till you pass access for my independent study course, which is in essence just paying for three months worth of the independent study course, and then you have access to it for as long as you need for up to two years. 
So let's see. And Matthew, honestly, I've never had anyone finish all of my content in 30 days. There's just there's just too much to go through, and usually it takes two two 30 day periods to go through all the content. There's just a lot of a lot of content to go through. Let's see, Nat. So for the individuals, the material is structured the same way. Yes. So it's it's independent. So it depends a lot on your schedule. Some people blast through the videos really fast and then work on the assignments later. Some people do it as if they were in the live class. I mean, it, again, it just it depends on your independent independent schedule. And so that and we can always talk about that in email if there's something specific or a specific question you have there. Akirti, can we do group study too? So as a part of the live course, you can add your name to a, a list of students who are seeking study partners. And from that list, you can try to create a study group or find a Facebook group. I always create a Facebook group for the course too, so you can find other people and, and interact with them that way. We, we try to give you as much opportunity as we can to interact with your fellow classmates. Some people, I, I tried this a while ago, and this was a long time ago, and I failed miserably. I tried to assign study partners. And it just doesn't work. Everyone's schedules and personalities are just too different. I just I can't assign it, but I do try to try to create lots of environments where you can find a study partner or a study group. And I recommend it. I think there's a lot of power in having an accountability partner or someone there with you along the way as you as you prepare for the exam. See, ZJ, I'm having a hard time coming up with a study calendar. I'm still feeling lost. Well, we'll talk about that when we get going on the course on Saturday. And really just working consistently a little each day on, on something, especially on your weakest areas, is kind of the, the best starting point for you. All righty. So with that, let's switch gears. We've been going for about an hour now. I want to, I want to do some practice questions. And I know some of you have been waiting around for this, so I'm going to hurry and give you the practice questions so that, you know, I, I feel like this is where the real meat and potatoes of the course is, is that we can get your questions answered about material so that you feel more confident on test day because we practice it. And some people, I mean, maybe this is creepy, but some people say they hear my voice explaining something or they, they see the PowerPoint slide and they're able to understand or think about things a little better. So. Okay, so here we go. Here are your practice questions. I have two of them available. What I'll do is I'm going to post the question up on the PowerPoint so you'll be able to see it on the PowerPoint. I'll ask you to, um, ask you to only click in your answer. Don't type it in. Please don't type in your answer. Just click it in. Again, it's a random poll. I can't see who is answering what. I just see percentages of, you know, 50% of the class says this, that, or the other. And it helps me understand what you're doing. And I'm going to shut up and give you 72 seconds to answer this item. And then we'll talk about it together after 72 seconds is up. Because that's what the test is like, is 72 seconds. So with that, get my timer out. Okay. On your marks, get set, and go. 72 seconds begins right now. Go. All right, about 10 more seconds, about 10 more seconds. All right, and time. So that was 72 seconds. goes fast. What I really should do while you're doing that is I should really cough and try to sneeze and, and distract you while you're doing it. Okay, so a patient who has suffered a traumatic blow to the knee begins to exhibit signs of tibial nerve dysfunction. 
the thinking tibial nerve here. Which of the following impairments will most likely be present with a tibial nerve injury at the level of the knee? Now, the key here is that the uh, deep peroneal nerve, and the peroneal nerve separates above the level of the knee. So down below the level of the knee or at the level of the knee, you have an isolated tibial nerve impairment, which results in answer number four. The tibial nerve is obviously hits that those plantar flexors, the triceps, sorry. So that makes sense. Then it alters sensation to the plantar surface of the foot. So that's what the tibial nerve does. And this would be as a result of someone who had a you know a pretty traumatic knee injury or a compression type injury at the level of the knee, like especially to the posterior knee, and they got um, what do you want to say? They they got a, a major issue to the tibial to the tibial nerve at the level of the knee. Now, they love writing questions like this. They love writing questions like this, where it's written in pairs. And you can see what I did here. Weak ankle plantar flexion. You see there's a pair here. Plantar flexion with one change. There's the dorsal surface versus the plantar surface. Or you look at the other two, and you can see there's ankle dorsiflexion with dorsal and plantar surfaces as well. Now, a lot of people always ask me, Will, I can narrow it down to two. So a lot of you can narrow it down to number two or number four, meaning that you know the tibial nerve hits the plantar flexors. So that makes a lot of sense. But which one is it, the dorsal or the plantar surface for the loss of sensation? So this is where reviewing the content is really your biggest goal or your biggest key to answering these paired questions or these paired answers. And you'll see this come up a ton on the NPT, having a paired answer where two things are similar and then two things are different in each one, and they kind of flip them, flip them around. Because one, it makes you read the question very thoroughly, and two, it makes you really know, okay, which is it? Is it plantar or dorsi? Is it the plantar or the dorsal surface? So that's the key here. I, I chose to, to practice this question with you because we see this a ton, the pairing of answers where two are very similar to the other two. Boom. So with that, I'm going to open up another survey. I've got one more practice question for you. So wait for it. Here it comes. And I'll do the same thing. I'll be very quiet. Although, like I said, I really should call these. I'll be very quiet for 72 seconds. And we're going to roll out the question as soon as I get my clock going. I'm using my phone to time this. Let's see. Is that the answer? Okay. Ready, set, go. 72 seconds begins right now. Go. All right, about 10 more seconds. 10 more seconds. All right, and time. Sweet. Okay, so this is a tough one. I got you, got you about 50-50 on A or B. So this is a good one to review, and you'll never get this one wrong again. So a patient is noted to have limited great toe extension during the terminal stance phase of gait. In order to increase the first metatarsal phalangeal joint extension, which joint mobilization would be most appropriate? Well, the correct answer is, so the proximal phalanx, as you go into, um, what do you want to say? As you go into extensions, you're extending that toe. It is a convex surface, and so you glide it in the same direction or a dorsal glide in order to help with extension of the great toe. You help, well, let me say that again. In order to assist with extension of the great toe, you would move the toe or you would glide it dorsally. 
So let me let me uh, draw this out for you. And so each pretty much each live session I have, I do something like this where I, I try to draw something out for you so you can see it. Because I, I like to be I'm very visual. I like to see how things work. So on your 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 metatarsal phalangeal joint, the end or your metatarsal head is a convex joint or a convex surface, I should say. And then it's a concave surface on that first or that proximal phalanx that comes together. And it has a head too. And then you go to the next one. So you have this um, more or less. That's, that's your great toe with your proximal and distal phalanx. So if this is our target joint, and we want to bring the great toe into extension. So if that is extension, and they're a little bit stiff, we want to help them, or we want to do some joint mobilization, which way do we glide it? Well, we glide it in the same direction. The way I think about this, let's see if I can get this to type. So concave means we go in the same, same direction. I capitalize the A because in concave, there's an A. That's how I remember this. Concave, same direction. Convex equals opposite direction. So in order to increase or improve the, the extension of the great toe, we would provide a glide in the same direction. So that means that the glide would be a dorsal glide or move them moving superiorly. And the way I think about that is if you put your hand over, you know, if you have a concave portion of the joint and a convex portion of the joint, and you put them over the top, in order to slide over the top of that joint, it has to slide in the same direction that you're going. And that's the idea that you have this, this gl glide that occurs in the same direction. And so really, if you understand the convex concave rule, the next thing you have to understand is which end or which segment is the mobile segment and which segment is the fixed segment. So in our example here, the great toe, typically, and not always, but typically the distal segment is the mobile segment and the proximal segment is the fixed or immobile segment. And just what I mean by that is, you know, usually your foot, you're stabilizing the metatarsal and moving the phalanx on top of the metatarsal. Now, there are some specific instances where it's reversed, but it, it, again, if you understand which side is fixed and which side is mobile, and you un understand which side is convex and which side is concave, it makes this rule just like butter. You got this one. Sweet. So there's convex concave rule as it relates to this. And we had about 50% of you get this one right and about 50% of you got this one wrong. So it's a good, this is good practice. So if you just look at those joints, you'll see the concavity and the concavity helps you understand which side is convex and concave. The goofy joints are the saddle joints of the thumb and the, sterno, uh, the sternoclavicular joint. Both of those are saddle joints which have convex and concave portions. So that's worth, definitely worth going and reviewing as well. Sweet. Okay, so with that, we're going to polish up. We've been going for an hour and 18. I know you guys, uh, I, you have, um, I want to be very respectful of your time. I know you guys have things to do. And so just hit one more plug. We start on Saturday morning. So be sure to sign up ASAP if you're going to dive into that live course. It'll be awesome. I think you'll love it. Those of you who are already in the course, I'll see you at 8 a.m. Mountain Time on Saturday morning. It will go for about two hours and we'll do a little bit of housekeeping about the course. And then we're going to hit content, tons and tons and tons of content. Let's see, Susan, I'm signed up for the independent study course. Can I watch this later? And as I'm just now coming home from work, I'll try to have this on my blog. And Shruti already posted the link, blog.ptfinalexam.com. Um, does this course start Saturday morning? Yes, we start up first thing Saturday morning, 8 a.m. Mountain. Well, those of you who are Eastern time, it's 10 a.m. So you'll be, uh, hopefully you'll have been up and done two hours of studying before you know, before we even get going. But for me, we'll be starting at 8 a.m. Those of you in the Pacific time zone, I used to have it earlier, and the Pacific time zoners hated me because it was so early. So I tried to bump it a little bit and make it 8 a.m. instead of earlier so that it's a better fit for you guys too. So 
Okay, so what I'll do is I will leave this chat box open for a few minutes. So if you want to track down a study partner here, you can. If you're a part of the live course, just go to the live course page on the website and you, you'll see a link to a document and you can track down the document on the live course page. It's in the right column. You'll be able to find study partners. So awesome. So with that, I'll sign off and uh, I'll try to get these recordings posted in my blog shortly. And uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to participate with us. Uh, when we do close out the webinar, you'll get a, a, a chance to answer about how the webinar was for you. If you liked or any suggestions or any sort of review you have for me, so please take the time to answer that. Uh, send me some questions if you have them. Email me, admin at ptfinalexam.com, or you can click the contact button on ptfinalexam.com. And until then, I wish you all the very best as you study and prepare for this awesome exam. And I look forward to having you as my colleagues in the PT world. So with that, we'll sign off. Peace out, and uh, I'll catch you later.